All right, um, I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so I was planning on basically today and on Thursday going over the problem set and the program assignment. So I did talk a little bit about the problem set. Um, was it last two? No, I guess it was the week before Thanksgiving because we didn't meet on um, a week ago. So last Thursday. Uh, but, uh, but I'll talk about that a little bit more. So there are a lot of, I had some good videos this for this unit, um, going step by step through all the um, um, process scheduling algorithms, which is basically what we're concentrating on here. So, um, so, um, so uh, I, I talk a little bit about that a bit, but uh, maybe um, we'll start with the problem set a bit, see if people had questions on that. Um, so uh, there's three questions. All of them are really about um, um, doing some version of process scheduling. So the first one, we're giving uh, basically the same kind of information that we're given for all these problems. Um, um, for our textbook and also the, the same kind of thing that we're going to be using for the programming assignment, uh, which is basically the, the process and when it's going to arrive. And um, in this case, what we're calling the burst time is what we call the service time. So that's that's equivalent. So um, uh, there's some subtle differences between what we mean by burst time versus service time, uh, but um, uh, maybe I won't go into those here, um, but you can kind of consider those the same thing, like for the problem set, right? So that, that just means that that you know this first process one has to go for sixty milliseconds, um, and so on. Right? And we do have one additional thing here because one of the questions asks to do a, a, pr a priority based scheduling, right? A simple priority based scheduling. So um, if you've looked through the materials for this week, uh, we don't have something, our textbook doesn't have something called a priority scheduler, but basically the feedback scheduler um, is um, a type of priority-based scheduling uh, where we're using, um, keeping track of how often the process has been preempted um, and then putting that to lower priority queues in order to implement a kind of priority scheme. So, but, um, but yeah, since we didn't um, have an explicit kind of priority scheduler, um, let me just kind of mention that here for the problem set. So I, I do need to have um, for this first one, basically I, I should see like a full schedule for these. So so, um, so when I say show the resulting schedule using a time scale diagram, um, the simplest thing you can do is something like, you know, say uh, process one ran from time zero to 10, and then process one ran again from 10 to 20, and then Two, 20, 30. So, that would be an example of the schedule. So I think that um, um, that would be an adequate way to represent that, like in like in 10 millisecond time step, right? So you, you don't really need that. So for example, for the round robin, we're using a time slice quantum of 30. So you know that every time something is scheduled, it's gonna be scheduled for 30 milliseconds. Well, you know, it might not use up the whole time slice quantum. So, so like process four, when initially is scheduled for the round robin scheduler would use uh, an initial 30 milliseconds um, and then it would have 10 milliseconds left. So it wouldn't use up all of its time slice quantum. Same for process two, it only has 20. So when we schedule it for 30, it would only use uh, 20 of the 30 milliseconds so but anyway you know something like that you know just a list of problems but, but in this case you can't just give me the list of processes for question one because again i can't really tell whether process one ran for 30 milliseconds or less so you do need to also indicate the, the time period that was running on for each of these or you could do it more like a then diagram for text would done something like that. And this is fine too, although this is, this is similar. You could do like process one, process two, and say like process one ran from zero to 30, process two ran from 30 to 30, process two. All the questions, we need to give a, um, a history of the um, resulting uh, 
schedule of the processes. So, so when we're talking about process schedule, it's, 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 it's that. It's the information about which process was running for which time on the system, right? Um, and if I didn't mention it on this question here, we're assuming for the first two questions, well, for, for the first question that um, um, it's a single CPU system. So the third question I'll talk about here a bit, uh, we, we work with a multi CPU system. So, but here only one process can be running at a time. Um, so um, for that then, like I said, I'm not gonna go through uh, all the details of all the process scheduling. Um, again, um, you can look through the lecture videos on those. Uh, I, I asked you to do a shortest remaining time, a preemptive shortest remaining time. So that basically means that um, we need to schedule either whenever a process finishes or when a new process arrives, we have to uh, preempt the current running process and select uh, the next process to run. And, then we're, and if, if you're using short remaining time, you need to look at all the processes that are currently in the system um, and um, select the one who who's, has the least amount of time remaining to run. That should be the one that runs next, right? So, so preemption versus non-preemption is, is a basic distinction for these process scheduling alg algorithms. So, so some of the ones that we talk about are non-preemptive. So that basically means once you schedule a process, um, no other process is gonna be scheduled until that one completes. That's non-preemptive. Whereas preemptive, so round robin and the shortest remaining time using preemption are both gonna be preemptive. So we schedule a process, but it might not run for its full burst time or its full service time. It, it might run for just a part of that, and be returned back to the ready queue uh, um, or the, the, the list of ready processes. And then we make another scheduling decision among the, the ready processes. So, so yeah, uh, I mean, you know, shortest time with preemption. Um, um, so, you know, at, at time zero, only process one. So it's gonna be scheduled initially. So when you only have one process, um, um, no matter what kind of, mechanism you're using to select the next process. If you have one process, it's pretty much the, uh, you know, the, a straightforward decision. You select that process to run. So process one would be running, but um, um, it runs for 60, but you know, process two um, and three both arrive before process one is done. So and in fact, after 20 milliseconds, process two arrives. So at that point, you're going to stop process one, figure out what the remaining time is for process one and two, and select the one with the shortest remaining time to run at 20, right? So that, that's what the shortest remaining time is. Uh, priority then, so, so, as, so like I said, I was going to mention this. So this is simple. simple. Um, our textbook doesn't talk about an explicit priority based, but here, since it's non-preemptive, that means that once you schedule a process, it's going to run to completion, but then when the current running process is done, you look at the processes that are currently ready, you know, waiting to run, and the one with the lowest priority you run next. And with with the as is described here, a smaller number means a lower priority. So here, the um, or it means a higher priority. It's, it's, it's a, you know, I don't want to confuse on that, but but here, if all four of these processes are running. The, the process two has the lowest number, that means it's the highest priority. So it would be scheduled to run if all four of these were ready to run. And the last one to be scheduled to run would be process one. It has the biggest number, which means it's the lowest priority. So it's a little bit confusing, I know, but that's, that's pretty common. If you look at real operating system implementations with an explicit priority, they often use a lower number to mean, um, this is the highest priority. I guess you can think of that, you know, this has first priority, second priority, third priority, if, if that makes it simpler. So. Um, and then, yeah, I asked for a round robin. We've actually already run across round robin all the way back for assignment two. So, um, but we kind of revisit it again um, in our unit five here. So round robin is the idea that you keep a ready queue um, and then you take the, the process that's at the head of the ready queue that's the one that's been waiting the longest to run, but you schedule it only for a particular amount of time. So we use a, a time quantum of 30. So this is an example of a preemptive scheduling policy. So once, for example, when process one runs for 30 milliseconds, it's gonna be preempted, returned back to the end of the ready queue, and then whatever process is at the front of the ready queue would be scheduled to run for another time slice of quantum of 30 or until it's finished. It might not, might not complete off its full 
um, time slice quantum, depending on how much remaining time it has when it's uh, scheduled. Um, right. So that was that was the first question for the problem set. Um, you know, make certain though. So even though I only asked to do like shortest remaining time and round robin, that you can do the other ones like shortest process next, um, highest uh, response ratio, um, things like that. So so five or six are discussed in chapter nine. So so you'll probably get others of these uh, first come first serve. Um, oh yeah, I gave an example of what the first come first serve schedule would be. So. Um, yeah, I gave that because because yeah, this would be a good um, for, for for the the three that you're supposed to do. If you give the same kind of result, it is basically what you need to give me for A, B, and C, like like the same um, kind of output or or work to show the full schedule. So, um, but yeah, for our our test, um, so um, if um, if I didn't mention it, so so I uh, I don't really have anything scheduled for uh, finals week. So so we are wrapping up with our f last week of full classes next week. Um, although I, I can be flexible on like the the test time, as I've discussed with some people, so that's fine. Um, so I might extend um, um, some of the assignment dates or that that test date uh, if if that would help people. Uh, but but right now I've I've got you know uh, the problem set and the program assignment are due. Um, at the end of this week and then our last our fifth test is not really a final test our, our test over unit five that is due at the end of next week which is our last full week of classes so um, but there can be some flexibility if people need need that that week after that which is the week for finals week uh, to finish up some things too so. um so, but anyway, so there might be, there'll be similar questions like this on that fifth test, but you know, maybe with some of the other scheduling policies. So make sure you can do any of those um, besides the ones here on the problem set. So, um, so for question two, I'm gonna have to bring up the textbook here. Um, this this refers to the a particular figure um, from our textbook here. So what I'm kind of looking for here is maybe like a plot um, um, I, I guess yeah, I am looking for a plot. So, so get out of plotting. You, you can do it by hand, I suppose, but it might be better to, you know, um, however you normally do plots, like uh, maybe from a spreadsheet. Uh, you can often plot things from calculate numbers, that kind of stuff. So, so a basic line plot, uh, similar to Figure nine point nine, uh, where you give it, um, give me the results using a simple average and then exponential averaging with alpha 0.5 and 0.8 okay um and and i can discuss this a little bit here um i, I think again I, I talk a little bit about this on the uh, lecture videos um but um uh, let me bring up that uh, figure here from um Chapter nine. So um, this thing about the um, uh, um, here, the uh, exponential averaging, um, this was in a section that was discussing some of the, the um, details and, and this gets into the difference between uh, service time and burst time okay so in a real operating system normally you don't like have a process that you submit to the system and you know how long it's going to run and that's kind of what service time means is that uh, we're, we're, we're going to submit process A in the system and it needs to run for five minutes have the service time of five right so that, that that's kind of more normal for old batching systems where you might know that or be able, be able to estimate the service time but um, you know, a modern operating system that's multi-programmed um, um, and, and that's doing process scheduling works uh, more like with like doing some sort of round robin and um, time slicing. Um, so in that case, you know, you don't really know like how long a process is going to run. But uh, if you wanted to implement um, one of the scheduling algorithms like shortest remaining time or shortest process next, 
uh, you'd have to have that information, that service time information or the, 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 the burst time, right? You have to have some estimate of how much time is remaining um, for the process or alternatively, you, the, the burst time um, differs is what it is, is how much time, if you schedule the process, how much time it's going to take before it needs to do um, its next bit of, of input output. So where it would have to be blocked waiting for some disk IO. So that, that's really what normally what we mean by burst time. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, for, for a, a modern operating system, that's the way things mostly work is that, that we schedule a process and it runs until um, it interrupts itself because it has to read or write something from a disk, right? So, so, so lots of processes are IO bound. So, so if you can estimate its average burst time, then you can use that like the service time. It, so, so if you know how long usually a process takes from when it's scheduled to when it needs to um, do its next IO. So if you can calculate that average burst time, you can use that um, instead of service time to implement something like shortest process next. So in that case, it'd be like shortest burst time next um, or shortest remaining time. You know, you could do the shortest uh, uh, remaining burst time. You know, well, it's kind of equivalent in that case, but that, that's what we're kind of getting at at this section in our textbook here with the, um, um, uh, the average here. So we're, we're trying to estimate what the next burst time would be for a process based on a previous history of the process. Okay, so simple average is is is, is simple as it says. So so basically, let's look at um, um, like this one here. Um, um, the, the 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 square um, filled in square is the actual observed values. So uh, for this process, um, it took one unit for its burst time initially, and then it took two and three. So it was increasing, right? So if you just take a simple average, um, like at time five, you're just basically averaging one plus two plus three plus four. Um, so the simple average would be um, um, the average of the previous four time steps, um, which is you know uh, uh, ten divided by four, or you know two point five. Is that what, what they're getting here? Looks like or three point five. Should be getting something like that. I, in this one. I guess I'd have to, to sit down here. They, they might be including the previous and the current time. So if we added like one plus two plus three plus four plus five, took the average of those. Is that what they get here for the? Um, so, so the simple average is oh the simple average oh is the um, the um, the empty square here. So it looks like two at time five. So that's probably just the previous four time steps. So if you take the average of one plus two plus three plus four, that's uh, 10 divided by four, which is 2.5. Uh, looks like they're getting two there. Oh, yeah, probably, they're probably getting 2.5. So that's probably what they're doing with the simple average, you know, right? And, and the same thing's being done on, on part B of, of here, but but with a different process that started with burst, burst times of 20 and, and was decreasing um, um, as it was running here. So, so it's burst times were getting smaller and smaller, right? Um, so the simple average is, is pretty easy to calculate. So you should should just calculate it as the average of all the previous up to, but not including that time. Right now, what these these figures are trying to illustrate is that a simple average isn't a good predictor. So if the burst time is changing, notice how much the. So you can think of this as predicting what the next burst time would be, but this the, a simple average will lag very far behind, right? So it's going to take a long time for the prediction to be 10 for this process that was increasing from one to 10 here, right? So, so this is not a very good prediction. That, that's why we use the um, these exponential scaling. Um, um, so an exponential scaling is, is kind of an average, but it, it gives more weight to more recent values, right? So the higher value of, of alpha, the more weight you give to the, the immediately uh, previous values in your estimate of what the next predicted burst will be, right? So the, um, uh, where's the, um, so you give some formulas here. So I'm basically, I'm asking you to use this, right? So the, the, your next prediction at time n plus one, you take alpha times the previous time step plus one minus alpha times your previous prediction. That, that's all you need to do to get the exponential average, right? 
And for the, the, the question for problem two, I ask you to do that uh, with an alpha of 0.5 and an alpha of 0.8. Right? Um, and if you do that, you should get figures similar to this, but I give you, um, what was it? I give you, um, yeah, I, I give you this sequence, right? So instead of steadily increasing or decreasing, um, it, it, uh, at time, at time, let's call it time one. So like the figure, if we start at time one, um, at time one, it had a burst time of six and then it went down to four, went back to six and then four. And then all of a sudden it started having large burst times of 13 between uh, when it ran and had to do a snack okay? So that, that's, the, that's kind of the sequence of times. And so you have to plot the uh, simple average and then an exponential average with two alpha values. Uh, that makes sense. So, so, so really, I mean, all I'm looking for is um, a figure like like this, right? But for that sequence, right? Although it would be useful um, along with the figure if you give me like maybe a table as well of the um, of your average that you were plotting, right? So again, again maybe a spreadsheet would be useful for this to, to calculate these or something like that. Um, All right, so I think, you know, so, you know, don't, don't make, don't try and make this too complicated. That's, that's all I'm looking for. It's kind of like a reproduction of that figure and, and showing that you understand what this, how to calculate that exponential average and what we mean by that, you know, using that formula, so. But, but this is important. So, you know, most of the um, examples of the um, um, scheduling algorithms are kind of using that service time and, and that's, like I've already mentioned, is more of, of kind of an older bashing system way of thinking, you know. So, so here is, is how we might use those kinds of scheduling algorithms where you have to know kind of uh, the remaining time or the amount of time for the next burst is, is we might estimate what the next burst time will be by, by keeping a history of the burst times of each process um, and then calculating an average or some sort of a, a weighted average, which is what the exponential um, uh, average is, right? Um, and, and normally the exponential average is gonna be more responsive. So you, you don't wanna use a simple average, but you wanna use something like a, a weighted average that uh, takes into account more of the recent history or it gives more weight to the recent history rather than um, taking the whole history into account. Another way to do this is to do like a simple average, but you just keep a window, right? So, so something similar to an exponential average is, uh, an average, but just of the last five burst times or five times that. That gives you a similar performance to an exponential average. Um, all right. And then um, for the last problem on, on the problem sets, um, I ask you to do by hand to simulate um, a multi-CPU system. Okay? So this, this is related to the readings in chapter 10 that you're supposed to be doing for this unit, where we talk a little bit about um, scheduling where you have more than one CPU, you know, some of the, the additional issues that come up um, in that case, right? So here, again, what I'm looking for um, is the same thing. You could use this, although again, I think it would be simpler in this case to give me um, a diagram that looks something like you know, here's CPU ones processes and CPU two uh, processes um, and uh, what do I have? So, so here we're just kind of using simple time steps. Um, so you know, from zero to one, one to two, two to three, two to four, whatever. Uh, and saying on CPU one process A ran and then process B ran on CPU. Two from zero to one, and then from one to two, process C ran, and then process B ran. Something like that would be perfectly fine to your answer for this one, right? Um, the difference being that uh, you know we've got two CPUs instead of one, so uh, it is possible for you know two processes to be running in parallel for this problem, but. Uh, another thing, you know, so this is getting away a little bit, but it's never possible. All these processes are single threaded, 
So it's incorrect to ever have me showing a schedule where you've got process A running on CPU one and CPU two at the same time, right? So all the processes are single threaded. They, they can only be running on one CPU at a time. Um, and it is possible for the CPU to be idle, right? So maybe A runs in C, and then maybe CPU one is idle. These the CPU doesn't have anything running at a particular time step. So, so um, our chapter 10 talks a little bit about this. There, there's two main ways of doing, there, there's two main extremes, I should say, of, of kind of doing uh, multi CPU scheduling. So, one, you can just use a, a single common ready sheet. And as processes arrive, put them on the ready sheet, so use the front and back. And then whenever um, uh, CPU is preempted, you know, so the, so the process exceeds time that quantum or the process is finishing, so whenever the CPU needs to make a scheduling decision, uh, it just takes the process, the, the process to set the front of the common ready sheet. In this case, you one. And, and I gave some rules here to, to disambiguate um, if there was, um, you know, um, um, uh, some possibility of differences. So, so there should only be one correct answer for this if you follow these rules. Um, so, um, so if both CPU one and CPU two are making a scheduling decision, uh, CPU one schedules first. Right. So, so if both CPU one and CPU two schedule at time zero, CPU one would be. Processes at the front of the queue, um, I get the schedule to run, and then CPU2 would schedule the next. What the first one is talking about. Um, So uh, the other thing, I mean, our, our textbook, um, I, I probably talked about this in the lecture video. So there is another, just some, another kind of ambiguity. So the way our textbook, um, if, if, if CPU one, so even when you're talking about single CPU scheduling or multi CPU scheduling, uh, there is ambiguity. So if process B is arriving at time two, and CPU one is writing process A and it times out, Time to you have to in order to get the same answer the textbook does you have to um, put these two processes on the CPU. We've got two things needed to be put on the queue at the same time. Time two, right? Um, I guess the same thing could happen if we had two things arriving at the same time, but um, we never kind of do that. But in this case, what the textbook does is, um, and, and what I describe here is that the the, the newly arriving process goes on the queue first. Okay, so, so here, if something is timing out at the same time something is arriving, uh, B should go on, on the queue first. So if the queue is empty, it would go to the front of the queue, followed by, followed by A, then um, at the time out, it will get added after. Right? So that's the other thing that's being talked about um, on one here. Um, is, the process arriving at the same time, CPU one and two time out, right? And 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 yeah, likewise, you know, so if B was arriving and A and C are both timing out of two, uh, what that is saying is that um, B the arrival goes on first, and then um, A's timeout gets on the queue next, followed by her. CPU one's timeout gets on the queue followed by CPU two's time. If there was two simultaneous timeouts um, on the process uh, on the two um, CPUs, um, so yeah, we're using the time. We are. I haven't mentioned it yet, but you have to uh, use round robin um, time slicing on this, which you should be relatively familiar with at this point. With a time slice quantum of three, so we're going to schedule processes to run for three time slices. Uh, and then they'll be timed out and return back to the queue for the common ready queue. Um, 
So whenever the CPU is idle, uh, I already discussed this, if both CPU 1 and CPU 2 are idle at the same time, CPU 1 will run the dispatch first, to get the one at the head, and then followed by CPU 2. Uh, and then it is possible for, pro for um, CPUs to be idle. So if there's no process on the ready queue, when the CPU is ready to dispatch, the CPU has to be idle for um, a timestamp and try again at the, the start of the next time. So if you follow those rules as described, you should get exactly one. There's only one kind of correct schedule if, if you're doing the preemptions and the timeouts um, as described here. Um, and kind of finally, um, um, before I kind of move on here, so the, uh, the other end of the spectrum, instead of having one common ready queue, uh, you might do what's known as, um, um, as a so you might have a specific queue for each CPU. So the CPU1's queue, the CPU2's queue, CPU two's queue right? So when a new process arrives, you have to make a decision. Am I going to send one from which CPU? Right? Maybe when A arrives, you decide this one's going to be running on CPU1, B arrives, this one's going to be running on CPU2. So, so, so when the, a new process is created or arrives, you have to make a decision. Uh, this has the CPUs to arrive. So this has the, the, the drawback that uh, it could be that these were really short processes. If these finish off and these are really long, CPU one then would be running the CPU two of the idle. So that must have a waste um, of resources. The schedule process involves CPUs on the same CPU, but I change the process as well. Short. So most operating real operating systems just kind of compromise sleep. So it's good to keep a process on the same CPU as we just discussed in chapter 10 because uh, this has to do with caching, right? So so often the CPUs have a private cache on those. And so there's performance implications if you want to run a process on one CPU and then switch to run it on another. It would invalidate all of the, the um, um, uh, cache information on, on the private cache of the CPU when you need to move it to a different one. And that causes a performance penalty. So, operating systems like to try to keep the process running on the same CPU if at all possible. But uh, they, they usually don't go to the extreme of, of always you know, scheduling the process to run on a particular CPU and keeping it there forever. Right? So, most operating systems try to balance they have. When they're doing multi CPU scheduling. So um, they will assign a CPU affinity, um, you know, so assign it to a particular CPU, but they might make a decision if one of the CPUs has become idle, doesn't have a lot of stuff on the CPU, they might select a process um, and move it over kind of explicitly um, to try and balance. So periodically, the operating system runs something to rebalance these. Um, one CPU, CPU's queue is kind of overloaded with the others. All right. And, and that's kind of in between having just a single common ready queue versus uh, uh, private queues that are um, um, specific to each CPU. So, so you might do some load balancing um, and, and move those around a bit. Um, um, again, that's some of the stuff, that's some of the material for chapter 10 that you should read about um, discusses those things. Um, all right, so yeah, that was that was the three problem set questions. You'll probably get some more questions to like both of these, especially the first one and the third one on the test five. So, so you know, again, make certain that you can do these kinds of process scheduling by hand and, and know what we mean by having a schedule and, you know, a resulting schedule for processes and their uh, um, arrivals and, and their service times, burst times and things. Um, all right. Um, so yeah, and then I thought, um, you know, I'd go ahead and start talking a little bit about specifics of the programming assignment. So uh, let's, let's switch to that. Um, so for the um, 
programming assignment five, uh, we are also implementing some process scheduling um, algorithms. So this has a similar structure to the previous programming assignment um, in that we've got an abstract base class. So we've got one class that, that uh, um, manages the, the simulation, um, you know, for, for the process scheduling simulation, but then we've got another hierarchy of classes uh, to implement different scheduling algorithms, like we had a hierarchy of classes to implement um, the different memory management um, um, algorithm for the previous um, programming assignment. Um, bring up the assignment description here to um, So um, similar to last time, uh, we start off with four tasks, uh, which are really um, um, implementing some missing member functions for the scheduling system. So this is the, 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 the overall simulation of process scheduling, uh, the, the class that manages that, right? Um, and then, um, for the um, second part of the assignment, this is more e even more open-ended than it was uh, for the previous assignment. So I don't give you like a starting um, set of, of files uh, like we did for the clock paging algorithm. So you, you not only have to implement another scheduling policy, you were, were given only the first come first serve, I believe, is the only scheduling policy you're given as an example for the program assignment, you have to implement one more. You can choose which one you want. So, um, you know, uh, people are looking, the, the simplest ones are probably like shortest process next or shortest remaining time, but you can implement any of those. You know, you can implement um, a highest response ratio. You could do a feedback scheduler. If you want a little bit of a challenge, try that. Um, you could do a round robin scheduler. Um, so, so any of the ones that are described in the textbook, um, you could go ahead and implement. So, um, so I'm gonna have to get my files here. Let me open that up again. Um, so, I mean, as usual, when you first start on the assignment, um, it should um, compile and run. So, for example, if we open up the tests, we should be able to do a, a clean and then uh, make all. Everything should build. Um, And then uh, make tests. Should uh, oops, no. um, should run and, and be passing. So in this case, it's, it's actually passing. Um, oh, um, I, I might uh, shouldn't be passing everything when you initially start. But probably must have some um, solutions in here. Just a second. Um, get back to the, um, yeah, let me get back to the initial state for all this. You're going to restore here. I should go back to the, um, um, what you guys could have initially uh, for the assignment five. Okay, let's try that again. So,
So again, it could be palm run, but um, you know, the, the, a lot of the tests won't be passing. The first one that should be failing is the get number processes. So, um, you know, so the first task is to implement some of the getter methods. Um, so, um, get system time, get number processes, is CPU idle. So, so the the first time in particular, the first two in particular should be uh, member variables of the class, you know, so kind of to hopefully, hopefully most people are kind of familiar with the basic idea of these at this point. So like um, get number of processes, there should be a member variable. Up. So, so the, the first four tasks are gonna be making changes into the scheduling system um, dot CPP um, file for the most part, right? So for example, the uh, get number of processes, let's find that one. Um, these are all stubbed out, but um, If you look at the scheduling system.htp file, um, there's a couple of different class, classes, but there's the um, um, scheduling system down here. So in particular, you know, there's some of the private variables you need for the first task are just kept as part of the class. So you've got number of processes, um, you should have system time, um, um, and then you might have to do a little bit extra work for some of the others, like to get the current process. Um, let's look at the, but, but, uh, but yeah, to, to return number of processes, you should be able to just return that member variable um, instead of returning zero to implement that. Um, so is CPU idle? Um, So here, um, you know, a lot of this is the, the structure is kind of given already for the, um, the, the simulator here for the scheduling system. So here uh, for like CPU idle, there is a, um, um, there is a um, member variable called CPU which will be set to idle whenever the, so it'll be set to the um, um, global constant idle whenever the CPU is idle. Um, and it will be set to uh, an actual process um, identifier. So um, um, the process identifiers are, are one, two, three, right? So we're actually using process names. Um, so I probably should have kind of shown the, um, um, the format of the, uh, the the input files for these simulations, right? So the 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 format is the same as like the um, examples from the textbook, right? So this is the input, you know. So so yeah, the first line is just saying that we've got five total processes that are going to be simulated by the system, but then the first column is the process name, and the first process is going to be assigned a process ID of one or zero um, by the system by default, and then the second column is the arrival time, so, so the, the the time the system arrives, and the third column is the, um, um, the system time, so the total amount of time that the process needs to run here, right? So process A, um, when it enters the system is gonna be assigned a process identifier of, um, of zero or one. Uh, anyway, that's, that's not gonna be idle. So that's, that's how you can check whether the CPU is idle or not. So if it is, equal to idle, then the CPU is, they should return true. Um, and if it's not, if it's not, if it's a valid process ID, that means that there's a currently a process running. So, so the CPU is not idle uh, in that case. Um, and yeah, to get the running process name, um, you're gonna have to use a combination of, um, So you can only get the running process name if the, the, the CPU is currently running a process. So if it's not idle. So if it's not idle, you know the process identifier. Uh, these, these must be starting at process ID zero because I think you can directly use these as indexes in the process table, right? So if, if process zero is currently running, then, then the CPU um, 
member variable will be set to the process ID at the current running process zero. And then you can use that as an index into the process table. Okay, so th this is actually an array of process items, right? So, so um, So, for example, you know, if the CPU is not idle, if it's not negative one, you should be able to use that as an index in the process table, and that will give you the ins the, the 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 process uh, instance uh, for the current running process. And then these are of types of the the process class is defined in the scheduling system. So if you just go up a little bit above. Um, the scheduling system, you see the, the definition for the process. So a process has the information that you need, including the name, which you have to return for the, the get process name for that, um, that first function here. But as the other information, like um, the process arrival time, service time, um, when it started, when it ended, um, information for the time slice, um, um, for time slicing, if we're doing um, time slice um, scheduling, like, like um, uh, round robin. So, uh, so oh no, that's not right. So this is the total time used. Uh, so we keep track of the total time, but particular scheduling policies might have to keep track of other information for a process, like the amount of time it's used in its current time slice quantum. If you were to implement round robin uh, time slicing or something like that. Um, All right, and then so on. So then the other the other tasks are implementing other member functions for the scheduling system. Um, um, although these are, you know, like usual, are doing a little bit more than kind of just returning information. So all processes done, you have to go in and, um, and I'll talk more about some more details about some of these on Thursday probably. But um, all processes done needs to determine if um, all the, if the simulation is finished or not, right? Um, so, so here, the, the, the processes have a field called done. So uh, an easy thing to do is just to, to iterate through all the processes. Um, and if you find any process that's not done yet, return false, but if all the processes are done, then you would return true, right? So again, if you look, um, we, we've got the, um, um, in our scheduling system, we've got this um, table of processes that you can access um, using an index, right? And if you search through all the processes, um, each one should have a Boolean variable that's gonna be false um, initially while the process is, is not yet completed. As soon as the process is completed, this should be sent to true, right? So you, you can tell whether any particular process is done or not by looking at that um, Boolean flag um, in the um, um, process here. Um, So besides the all process done, um, you have to implement the dispatch CPU of idle. So here's where we have the hook into the scheduling policy. So um, 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 if the CPU is idle, we're gonna be calling our scheduling policy object to make a decision about which process to run next. So, so the, um, the policy instance has a method um, called like dispatch, I believe, um, that should return the process identifier for the next process to, um, to, to dispatch or to schedule. Um, and then uh, finally on um, these, you also need to implement the check process finished. So um, this one, um, if there's a process running, you need to check if it's, if, um, if it's time used so far is equal to its total time and service time. So if, if, if it's used up its total time, then it should be set to being finished. And so here is where you're actually setting that done variable to be true. If you detect that it's um, run 
um, all, all the time that it needs to. Uh, oh, and you need to do some other things. So record when it ends, um, set the done to be false, like I just des described, um, and set the CPU to be idle. Um, so. um, all right, and then so let me kind of get started. We'll go into more details of this on Thursday then, but um, um, let me, let's look at also the, um, um, the scheduling policy hierarchy, okay? So like we had before, there's a base class called scheduling uh, policy, which describes the API for um, processes, uh, for classes that implement um, a scheduling policy, right? Um, and we only give you, um, you should only have first come first serve, right? So, so you won't have any others like shortest process next or shortest remaining time. In fact, I should just delete those. Um, You could only have uh, first come first serve initially, uh, right? So, um, so this defines the API that the scheduling policy classes need. So, so the big one being the dispatch function. So whenever the simulation needs to uh, schedule a new process, if CPU has become idle, it needs to schedule the next process, it'll call dispatch on one of these scheduling policies. And that's supposed to re return a process identifier, so 0, 1, 2, 3 of the next process that should be scheduled to run um, in the simulation, right? Um, and then there's some others, so like there's a preempt method, so if you're implementing um, a non-preemptive uh, scheduler, like um, shortest process next, um, you should always return false. So this, whenever this is called, um, this is going to be called by the simulation to determine whether we should preempt the current running process or not. So for non-preemptive processes, this would just always return false. But for preemptive processes, you have to keep track of, and whenever you get to a point where the process running process should be preempted, you should return true um, if you're asked whether you should preempt or not, and so on, right? So, you know, th these are virtual functions. So this is the, the uh, Base class. Um, um, policy. Define the API um, of which uh, we have one implementation, which is the first come, first serve. And let's look at its implementation a little bit, describe it, right? So, so all of these classes that, that derive which come for serve um, scheduling policy are just uh, children uh, of the, um, the abstract base class. So if you look at the header for first come first serve, you know, you'll see that it inherits publicly from the scheduling policy and it implements um, all of these um, abstract methods. Uh, so the dispatch, the preempt, reset policy, the new process. So in particular, first come first serve is non-preemptive. So like I was talking about here, if you look at um, the, um, let's look at the um, preemption. So, so since it's non-preemptive, it just returns false uh, for the preempt method. Um, First come, first serve basically works as a, um, you just keep a ready queue. And whenever a process arrives, you push it on the queue. And then whenever you have to make a dispatching system, you take the, the, the next process from the front of the queue, right? So if you look at the implementation of first come, first serve, um, it uses a queue of process identifiers for the ready queue um, as its private member variable. Um, and then, so it's, so the, the new process is called for the scheduling policies whenever a new process arrives. So for first come first serve, what we need to do is we need to remember that process and push it to the back of the ready queue. So that's all that the new process function does for first come first serve is, is push that new process to the end of the ready queue. And then dispatch is pretty simple um, for first come first serve. I mean, if, if the, 
um, if the ready queue is empty, there's nothing to dispatch. So you re return idle. So for all of the, for the one scheduling policy that you guys have to implement, um, if the ready queue is empty, you should just return idle. Or if you, if you have no process that you can currently run next, um, you should return idle. Otherwise you have to return the next process um, um, to run according to the scheduling decision being made. So first, first come first serve, you just take the process off the front of the ready queue uh, remove it from the ready queue and, and return that process. That will be the next process run in first come first serve. All right. Um, so then, just to wrap up, so what what you guys need to do then for the second part of the assignment is um, you probably want to start by using first come first serve as a uh, as an example, but, but you need to implement a different scheduling policy. So let's say you decide to implement um, highest response ratio next. All right. So, so to do that, um, I would start by by copying the um, the HPP and the CPP file for the first come first serve and renaming them and then renaming FCFS to whatever HRRN or SPN or whatever policy that you're going to implement. So you can do that within the um, API for Visual Studio Code. So I think you can like say right click and say copy. Um, and then if you click on like assignment, um, oops, I just say paste now or, or control V. Let's do control. So if I highlight and do control C and then control V, that uh, that, that will make a, a, a will copy the file and paste it. And then you can you know right click and do a rename. So in this case, um, HRRN, right? I need my HRN header file and I need uh, starting with first come first serve, but I want um, control C, control V. Um, no, oops. Um, I did the HPP again, that's not what I meant. So. so, and also want the um, CPP file. So, there we go. So that would be kind of the first step for whichever scheduling policy that you do. And, and, then, and then, you know, you could um, so like, for example, we can do like a global find replace first come first serve with whatever the scheduling policy is. Although you should also make an effort to update comments and things like that. But um, uh, let's see here. So for Visual Studio Code, Um, yeah, I think you can do it like a simple find or replace from the, uh, the, the, the find function. So, but be, you know, be a bit careful while you're doing this, make certain that you don't um, replace something you don't mean to. Right, so I did all those. Um, in this case, like highest response ratio next probably doesn't need a queue. So I'll, maybe I'll go ahead and also get rid of that. Um, so the other thing is you might wanna get rid of the specific implementations and, and stub out the functions, um, which I'll also do here. So let's, um, um, so let's open up the .cpp and do a similar kind of global search and replace. Uh, and after I do, do this, I would probably go through and kind of read through all the comments and, and update the comments. But um, well, we've done those. Um, and then I'll probably stub out these functions, right? So we're not gonna have the queue. Um, HRRN is actually um, preemptive policy. So I'm gonna have to do something different than just returning false if I wanna implement HRRN. Um, we're definitely gonna have to do something different 
for the dispatch, but for now we'll just always return, always return maybe idle. It's a good kind of stub default. Um, And you can probably leave the constructor because you want it to, to set the system to null and call the reset policy um, on the constructor here and um, so on. So, um, and then the other thing though, um, just to finish up here, uh, so this gets you started, but you also need to get this into your build system. So this is something that you haven't had to do before yet on, on assignments like this. So in this case, since I added HRRN, I want to add the HRRN uh, into the build portion of the, uh, the in my make file for, for my build system here. So what you want to do, um, there's probably some comments in here about this, um, but um, uh, you want to search for like, like, um, like there's a list of sources which only has first come first serve initially. So you need to add in whatever policy you're adding, both the header and the, um, CPP file. So my example here is the HRRN. Be careful here. So it is easy. If you have problems on your build, let me know. It is easy to, um, if you get your make file messed up, um, that you'll, whenever you try to do a, a make, um, that you'll get some strange error messages. So in this case, uh, like for the sources, these are all are supposed to be on just one line. But we've got them on multiple lines. So you have to have that backslash on all but the last line in order to make these continuations of this definition of all of the sources in this project here. Um, so I had to make sure I had the backslash there. Same here for the object. So we need to build the object file, um, but I need to make sure this is a continuation, and we need to add in the hrrn.o file we built. If we're adding that as the policy. Um, and uh, yeah, I might have even talked about this last time, but um, you also probably should add in uh, update uh, these um, um, dependencies down at the bottom. So HRR in object file is going to depend on the hrrn.cpp file. So if anything changes in hrrn.cpp, we need to rebuild hrrn scheduling policy.o object file. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I, I noticed this last time, I guess I haven't fixed this, but um, there, there's actually a mistake in the make file here. So um, um, Uh, first come first serve scheduling policy is done twice there so it probably meant the base class um, so so if anything changes on the um, um, scheduling policy header file base class or changes on the um, the new source file or the oh there, there yeah okay there it was scheduling policy basically Uh, no, okay, so I was right. So um, I had it right the first time. So if anything changes on the header, the new header file that we're creating, or the new source file, or in the base class header file. So yeah, that that, that does look right. Okay. So that's that's what you want. So so basically, all you're saying on this last line is is for the build system. If if anybody makes a modification either to the base class file or to the source or header file for HRN, we need to rebuild the object file, right? So I think that's all you need. If, if you add those in correctly um, to your uh, make file, and if you correctly create the stub, like I showed here, it should be able to rebuild and recompile. Um, and what you wanna check when you do that, if you do a make clean, the thing in particular to look for when you do the make all is, is specifically see if it's building your HRRN object file, right? So, so here you can see it, it built. So before you make this modification, it should be building scheduling system, scheduling policy, and first come first serve. After you add it, you should also see that it builds HRRN and makes the HRRN scheduling policy.o or whatever scheduling policy that you decide to work on. 
Um, and then the other thing though, is it should link it in. Um, so if you look at the test here, you should see that not only first come first serve, but HRRN gets linked in to create the tests. Uh, likewise, HRRN object files getting linked in to create the final simulation. All right. Um, and then to actually use your scheduling policy, I think we do have to make one more change into the um, sim file, but I'm gonna talk about that on Thursday, right? But that's enough to get you going um, on this assignment. So, so that's kind of the second half is that you, you know, when you're implementing your own scheduling policy, unlike for assignment four, you have to do a little bit of this work yourself. You have to create the source file and the header file for your scheduling policy, and you have to modify the build system a bit. So it will actually build, you know, uh, build your code and link it in to the simulation. Yeah. Um, all right. So yes, yeah, kind of about time to wrap up here. So I'll go ahead and wrap up. Uh, if, anybody, if you guys have some questions about things, um, let me know so we can answer some questions here. But otherwise, I think that's all we'll do today, and, and we'll do some more details of the assignment probably then on Thursday. Okay. All right. So I guess yep. for the um so for problem set question two. Yep. Problem two. Uh, so for the graph we pretty much just need uh three plot lines in it. Uh, the simple average and then the two uh symmetrical average. Yeah. Three, yeah, and and, and I guess you have the you can plot the you can plot the um the, the 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 process itself, so you could have a fourth one. So, yeah, um, um, I guess I probably would prefer to have the the fourth one. I mean, the, the same is on the the figure nine point nine. So the, the original first times of the process, and then the simple average, and then the two uh, exponential averages. So that would end up with four lines in that case. So. 